blessings. Hello and welcome to Higher Ed Next, a Best Colleges series where we discuss the past, present, and future of higher education, talking about the issues that matter with the people who know them best. My name is Cabretti D. Williams, Senior Editor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Best Colleges and your host for this series. On today's episode, I speak with Dr. Javed Siddiqui and Dr. Madeline Smith, the CEO and founder and the director of higher education at the Hunt Institute, an independent nonprofit that provides unbiased research, technical expertise, and learning opportunities that equip and empower educators to drive equitable reforms and become audacious champions for higher education. Very ambitious, but we love to see it nonetheless. During our interview, we're getting to the heart of the matter when it comes to all things education policy. Today, there is a wide array of public policy and legislative battles that will inevitably shape the future of colleges, including challenges to affirmative action, as well as recent state legislation that seeks to censor and limit free speech for race, gender, and sexuality, just to name a few. Additionally, we speak about the necessary changes that need to happen on the federal level to improve higher education and the Higher Education Reauthorization Act. Not sure what that last one is? Don't worry, we got you covered. Without further ado, here's our discussion. Dr. Smith and Dr. Siddiqui, welcome to Higher Ed Next and thank you for joining me for today's conversation. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for having us. Um, earlier this year, I actually had the opportunity to uh, facilitate a webinar for Black History Month where I learned a lot about the Hunt Institute. So um, if I may start with you, Dr. Siddiqui, as the president and CEO, you are notably coming from a political sphere where you were the Virginia Secretary of Education from 2013 to 2014. So what made you want to lead this institute? And from your perspective, what is the value of having this public policy organization in a state like North Carolina? When I had the good fortune of working uh, for then Governor McDonald in Virginia, we, we had a chance to really connect with Governor Hunt and the Hunt Institute, saw the great promise of what they did for us and were doing uh, across the country. Uh, so when my time as the Secretary of Ed came to an end, uh, I was looking at a couple options. I was a former school principal before going to joining the governor's office. I started looking at maybe going back into the K-12, looked at some higher ed opportunities. But I was really uh, sort of had been bitten by the policy bug. Having come out of the, the field of practice, uh, I got to see firsthand uh, the impact legislators, lawmakers, policymakers are having on the field of practice. And that's what really steered me toward the Institute. At the time they were uh, recruiting for a, uh, a new program they were launching. So I, I led that program for a few years. We're in the throes of uh, recruiting for our ninth cohort now. But after three years, I transitioned into uh, the board and uh, Governor Hunt uh, invited me to become the, the president and CEO of the Institute. Elected officials don't have the, the capacity, they don't have the staff, they're not able to really dig in and get steeped in these issues. And so we ended up, we like to call ourselves or refer, refer to ourselves as like an extension of the policymaker staff. So, you know, it's oftentimes you'll see Madeline working very closely with commissioners of higher education, you know, some of her peers across the country. And so we're doing some research, we're aggregating information from, you know, different states and then presenting it to, uh, you know, a state. And that's kind of what they did in Virginia. We were looking at some assessment issues. So the Hunters yeah. 2 came up and briefed the governor, uh, myself and a few others around what some of our peer states were doing. Uh, and so we, it, it, allows them to sort of have enough good information. Uh, we don't lobby, we don't have a legislative agenda, so they know we're not coming to them with information that is trying to guide them into a certain thinking. Uh, we're really just trying to package information in a way that allows them to sort of have multiple perspectives and have enough intelligence to make decisions that they believe are in the best interest of their citizens. And I think that is the sort of the overarching value proposition. And, you know, we cover everything from early childhood all the way to mm -hmm. um, from yes. prenatal to post-secondary is probably the best way to think about the work we're doing. Uh, and we're doing now across the country. Um, and yeah. we're, we've expanded to so many states because there's not enough folks that are sort of positioned the way we have positioned ourselves. Yeah. I mean, and I think being in that position where you, you function kind of as an in-between and an independent organization that brings all of this information to the policymakers, you're able to, to focus on the value proposition as well as the social impact, which I think a lot of your, the mission of the Hunt Institute is rooted in is having that social impact from prenatal to post-secondary, as you were saying. Uh, a follow-up to that, I'm curious, as someone who is 
worked on both sides of the aisle technically to effectuate change in education. How would you assess uh, the influence of politics on our educational system today? And what ways has it changed for the better um, or worse uh, since you were um, the Secretary of Education? Yeah, well, I mean, I, technically, I guess we're still in politics uh, at the Hunt Institute. We're uh, one of our taglines. It's, it's, that, it's that gray area, you know? Yeah, yeah. One of our uh, taglines uh, was uh, uh, we were at the, sort of the intersection between policy and politics. Um, yeah. and, and it takes a unique type person to work here. But I've been in this now for half my adult, uh, my professional life have been around sort of policymakers and, and uh, poli uh, politics. Uh, education, and for those of us that are in it and immersed in the field, uh, you know, we understand that most uh, education issues are nonpartisan. Uh, there is broad bipartisan support for many of the issues that uh, legislative bodies are grappling with across the country. Uh, it, it should never become p political. Uh, the reality is we know and, you know, sometimes the media or the local papers, uh, state papers, you know, they won't write an article on a, a piece of legislation that had 100 uh, percent vote, uh, you know, one 100 to zero. They'll write an article that was 52, 48 and or 50, 50 and the lieutenant governor split the vote and it went to the Democrats or the Republicans. And mm -hmm. so those like, you know, we I try to think about maybe about five percent of every legislative, every piece of education legislation that comes through legislative bodies annually uh, can get a little sticky or divisive. Uh, for us, we try to sort of remove some of the vocabulary um, where we're sort of talking past each other. And we think about trying to make sure we put the right people in, in the right conditions, sometimes just putting them in the same room. Uh, um, and I think we have done a really good job of nuancing uh, the messaging and, and bringing people together. And I think that's why in many of the states we're working with and many of the elected officials we're, we are working with, with um, they are finding success in advancing issues that are going to benefit uh, and have high impact on on, on kids and uh, in classrooms, whether they're pre preschool classrooms, K twelve classrooms, or university classrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Smith, I would actually love to get your perspective on that as well as someone who works closely um, with higher education policy. Um, what are your thoughts, and how would you assess the influence of politics on the educational system? I think it all comes down to the quality of life students are experiencing, um, regardless of the credential that they are working towards in their post-secondary careers. Uh, we see the impact of policy and politics when we assess student experiences, and it's so much more than just what goes down in the classroom, right? It's that whole student needs and um, that when a student feels supported, that is when we see those retention and persistence rates increase and ultimately those attainment right. uh, goals being met. So I really think that it just comes down to asking the individual student and then asking the collective across any given campus, um, what is your experience here and how can we improve that as policymakers? And that is the voice that we can bring to those policymakers here at the Institute. Yeah. For sure. And so great segue. Thank you. <laughs> uh, because I would say unless you are an, an expert or a practitioner in the education space, uh, sometimes education policy uh, can feel kind of like this nebulous topic that feels somewhat disparate from practice, particularly uh, at the college level, and especially for those uh, in students who aren't engaging with education policy on a, on a up close day to day basis, like policymakers or legislators or like you all at the Hunt Institute. So uh, if possible, can you both give us a clear definition of educational policy in the visible ways students can see the impact of policy on campus and within their college experience? Sure. So I really view education policy as definable by the principles um, and the decisions really that impact that student experience, the education experience, teaching and learning, but so much more than teaching and learning as well involved there. Again, it's the, that entire uh, student experience and what those decisions being made at both the state and federal level are doing for that experience or in some cases against that experience, right? So again, it's really just looking at uh, how are students being supported and then how can the decisions being made by policymakers improve um, those decisions so that ultimately students can reap the benefits of those decisions. And it can be really uh, a nebulous topic because it's very difficult to kind of separate uh, higher ed policy from more general policy, right? When we see certain policies and decisions being made in this country, 
uh, that can often have a trickle down effect for the positive or the negative. So um, I think that's when it becomes nebulous, and, but just really seeing the overall domino effect of those decisions across the general policy sphere and into the education sphere, that's when we can really uh, engage in that sound uh, policy decision making. And I would say, I think uh, the main reason that policy can feel somewhat disparate from practice, especially in um, post-secondary education is because it's, di it's difficult to separate uh, education policy from the greater social policy. Uh, we know students are more successful when they're supported in all aspects of life. Um, we had a piece maybe a year ago about, you know, Maslow, you know, sort of students' basic needs must be met for them to be successful in education. Uh, so shelter, food, uh, educational materials, resources, all those things you might not initially think about when you're, when you hear education policy. But um, I think one of the best examples I uh, I have some of a student panel we had uh, where there was a, we were in a state discussion uh, on higher education policy and we pulled together a panel of current uh, sitting enrolled students and one of the students said uh, to the crowd policymakers uh, when my bills were paid I made good grades uh, uh, and, and I thought that yes. sort of resonated uh, with everybody it certainly resonated with me it resonates um, with me too <laughs> yeah yeah uh, it was such a great reminder that there is so much more to education uh, than just what's happening in the, in, in the actual classroom or the, you know, the receiving of the instruction. When I really think there's a, we just lack clarity on higher education policy outcomes. Um, but that's where we, as the honest student, I think that's where we have served to bring voice. You know, we're obviously bringing student voice even uh, in front of lawmakers and policymakers. And I think that's the sort of the, the value proposition that we bring to the table. And that's why we're having so much success because folks know when they, are with us, we're going to, they're going to hear, as I said earlier, multiple perspectives, but from different voices or different stakeholders. And oftentimes the most obvious stakeholders, the consumer, the child, the student, um, they're not afforded a seat at the table. Which is interesting given that kind of going back to, uh, I, when I'm paid, I make better grades, right? In the sense of I, when you're going through the college experience um having so much of your life depend on your your academic progress um and a lot of your financial standing as a student be dependent on the institution and having that being guided by a policy uh certain under or a certain level of policy um can is is a lot and I, and I don't think a lot of students really recognize that how a lot of these policy decisions impact their livelihood on the college campus because I think we view college campus as one facet of a person's life and it is but I think for for um, a student who's going through those four to six or even those two years uh, depending on the institution that they attend uh, it can have a very large impact um, at least from my perspective, I was not paid, um, but I still had to make those grades. So, you know, you make, you do what you can, you do what you can to kind of navigate your experience and get to where you need to go. But uh, I think from my perspective, policy is huge um, in that regard. Absolutely. And I love that quote, but I do think it's also important to step back from it and look at, it's largely about finances, of course, but how are this, how okay. is the student being supported from a mental health perspective and just from a basic yeah. needs and security perspective as well? So yeah. it really transcends finances. Yeah. And we're seeing that now in terms of uh, the, the percentage of students that are experiencing homelessness and the amount of students across uh, the country on college campuses who are advocating for basic needs, uh, whether it be via pay or better benefits um, as they're trying to get a degree. Um, you wouldn't think that that would be what they need to worry about, but you know, it's it's a cause for concern for students, so therefore it needs to be a cause uh, of concern for us. Um, Javed, I want to uh, jump back to you. A couple months ago, you wrote an article about critical race theory, and in that article you said, uh, representation is important, not just in voice, but in creating spaces for brave conversations that push us forward and help us grow. Amid the noise, we miss the opportunity to hear the voices of students and teachers, the ones most impacted by the policies and decisions being made, literally what we just talked about. Um, and I think that this is a particularly poignant quote during a time when we see a wave of anti-trans and anti-LGBTQ legislation that targets school curriculum at the K-12 level, especially. And I think for CRT, it's now become heavily 
criticized at the collegiate level, which, I mean, gives me a little bit of concern um, as someone who went through a graduate program, learned about critical race theory, um, to see the sudden attack on it is slightly concerning. Um, but I think I'm curious to know from your perspective, what do these legislative trends suggest for the future of uh, critical theory and critical thought that supports representation and equity for different student populations? And how can and should institutions react to these trends at the policy level? Um, well, first of all, thank you for bringing up the article and, and for actually taking time to read. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for taking time to read it. Uh, as I reflect on that piece and g generally education as a whole, uh, so much boils down to the need for students to have educators and leaders who want to look like them, uh, have similar identities to them. Uh, not only does this allow for diversity of thought in education, but it also has an immense impact on student perceptions of their futures, their abilities. But I can tell you as a former school principal, I had to move some teachers on um, because when you go into a classroom and, and I, I bet, I don't know how, how uh, I assume we're all in a similar age bracket. So we probably all read uh, The Old Man and Sea, 1984, uh, uh, the Kill a Mockingbird, The Outsiders. Yeah. You know, there was a sort of standard what traditional text. And then, you know, you hear the teachers say the classics. Um, yes. I think one of the things we are really trying to encourage people to think about is, is really creating for more inclusive classrooms and making sure all students see themselves and hear themselves in the curriculum, in, in mm -hmm. the text. One of the best reading strategies that you can give to young people is, is uh, text coding. You make text to text connections where you connect a, a, a book you're reading to another book or another article you read. Mm -hmm. You make text to world connections. So something you're connecting with the book you're reading, something's happening in the world. And then text to self connections. I can't think of a time. And I said this as a principal to our school of teachers. You got to stop teaching these things. Uh, you got to bring materials and books in that will allow for kids to see themselves and hear themselves. I never saw myself growing up in, in making a text to self connection because the characters didn't look like me. They didn't have experiences like me. And while we're getting much better, we still have a long way to go. And that's for a host of uh, students. Uh, the, the list is long. And one teacher will say, well, how do I do that? Well, you break your classroom up into book clubs. You don't need all 30 kids don't, you know, well, I shouldn't say 30 because that's a large classroom, but all, all, right, the, kids in yeah. classroom, <laughs> all the kids in the classroom don't need to be read, reading the same book, you know, and then you can have create book clubs and let book, kids identify. But why does that not happen on, uh, on scale? It's because where the teacher read The Outsiders, let's just say 20 years ago, I don't need to read it every year. I know that book. I have my questions. I have my projects. I have everything done. So I'm just going to cut and paste and do it again next year. Now you're asking them to engage with five to seven books to create, you know, five to seven type of book clubs, a literature circle. Now I have to read all those books. And in three years, I might need to refresh and look for some new books because my circumstances might change. I might have a trans student in my classroom and I might want to make that student feel inclusive. So I might want to look for a text that's going to allow me to bring my con science content to life through uh, through a character that might you know, identify as a trans, uh, oh, a trans boy, a trans girl, trans woman, whatever. A uh, same for, you know, um, black, Hispanic, uh, people with multiracial, you know, it's just broken homes, uh, divorced parents. Those are all the things that we as schools can do a much better job, but it's, it's bigger than just the state changing the standards, right? The, there's curricular implications, which really generally go down to individual districts and the tentacles are far reaching because in districts where I live, there's 60 schools. And imagine how many fifth grade teachers there are across the entire division. So it's just a big undertaking and it's gonna change with the, some of the work that Madeline and our team are doing uh, with, you know, influencing the way higher education and teacher prep programs are, are sort of thinking yeah. about uh, how they engage students. Yeah, I mean, and in, in the sense that I think above all else, I think we have to recognize that our students aren't 
the same that they were 20 years ago. The world is not the same as it was 20 years ago. So while we all have our classics, I love To Kill a Mockingbird. I also love The Scarlet Letter, um, which apparently was very controversial. I also love Things Fall Apart, um, which was also at one point a very controversial book. There is controversy because there is an opportunity to have a critical conversation and really unpack what does this experience mean for me from my worldview and from the view of others who don't necessarily look like me? And I think when it comes to CRT, I think a lot of the, the, the noise around it is because people just don't understand it. And if you don't understand it, you want to attack it and criticize it and, and you can, but let's have a thoughtful conversation about what it is and not just create legislation that just bans the conversation writ large. I don't think that that's how you have a productive um, a productive understanding about identity in a world where I think identity is important. You need to kind of understand the way that you walk through the world and how others walk through the world because that leads to better communication and an ability to navigate spaces like college where you're going to see folks who are different from you, who may be trans, who may be a person of color, who may be low income, um, who are having these experiences and learn to, to work with them, understand them, and that they could possibly be a member of your community uh, moving forward. Um, And I think that that foundationally is kind of missing, the ability to have those critical conversations uh, starting in the K-12 space, um, because I think there's a lot of traditional structures to instruction um, where you may or may not, if you're depending on the school that you go to, you may or may not have that critical conversation or that dialogue uh, that's facilitated in a very lucid, productive way. Um, Madeline, do you have any thoughts about that? Absolutely. I think if those conversations are beginning, you know, in high school or not at all uh, before students step foot into their post-secondary pathway, you know, I don't know what the expectation can be at that point for um, having those crucial conversations that you're alluding to. Um, So it's just important that they start as early and as often as possible. and yeah, inclusion yeah. needs to be intentional. Yeah. In yes, <laughs> intentional. Um, and a built-in consideration of of the curriculum mm-hmm. and the the way that the curriculum is instructed. Because then again, that bleeds into uh, the college space. I'm curious if we were to look at the landscape of uh, education policy. Um, much of the this, discussion, I would say, has centered a lot on K-12. And that's for obvious reasons connected to funding priorities and the way that K-12 is structured and kind of managed by the state. And there's that's not to say that there aren't policy issues that don't um, that don't impact college students, but these, um, in my opinion, are, are far and few in between, especially at the federal level. I'm curious to get your perspective of why do you think this is and what would it take for legislators to push more for more legislation for higher education at the federal level? Or is there even a need for more legislation at the federal level for higher education? I'm a little biased coming from a higher education background, but I'm curious to get your thoughts. Yeah, I'll just start with, you know, I think the main reason uh, that students in the United States have the right to a free education, uh, which is defined as K kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, in many instances, it's like first to 12th grade. So there's like this idea of active, free uh, public education. Uh, so there's a clear role between state, federal policymakers to ensure our students are receiving an adequate education. Uh, I hate the word adequate, but that is sort of generally the house uh, received, uh, which will prepare them for higher education. Uh, I'll let Madeline uh, talk a little bit about her, her position on higher education. I think the reality is there's a long history of this being exclusive, uh, both, uh, both income and also certainly a race, uh, which is which has made it uh, difficult to advocate uh, for federal policy changes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's absolutely correct. There has been a very long history of that exclusion. And I would like to say the field is slowly but surely um, becoming a little more inclusive. So we see some of this in the uh, increased support for community yes. colleges, for workforce development, including CTE programs. And so that is great to see. But at the same time, we also need to continue informing lawmakers that education really is this continuum uh, model that we have. And like Javed uh, opened up today, with it's prenatal all the way to post-secondary and workforce regardless of what that means for the individual so um really just kind of 
hitting home that point, I think, with policymakers in a bipartisan way is that, hey, I think we can all get on board with the fact that this starts from day one and it goes throughout mm -hmm. the lifetime. So I think that that point is what really is going to help shape policy change. You, you mentioned community college, and I do want to come back to that, considering that Dr. Jill Biden sure. Um, and President uh, Joseph Biden at one point um, were considering legislation that would make community college free. And I know a lot of folks, including myself, were very like excited about the possibility of that happening. Um, alas, that did not happen. Um, yeah, yeah, let's let's. Let's be helpful, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But all that to say, I'm curious to get your your thoughts uh, on that point in the sense of, will we get to a point where um, uh, college education, or at least like those at public institutions, would be free for students? I think we're seeing remnants of that. I believe New Mexico just uh, had some legislation that was very uh, groundbreaking in that regard. But do you see any large scale mm -hmm. the that happening? Yeah, I think our attention here at the Institute and our research is really turning to what's happening at the state mm -hmm. level uh, with these initiatives, because, you know, sometimes at the federal level, uh, politics can yeah. get in the way on either side and in the middle of the aisle as well. So I think paying attention really, even in North Carolina here, we have state level grant programs available um, to help bring down the cost of tuition, at least for community college students. So we are seeing that across the United States. And I think that's very promising for the field um, as more students take advantage of those opportunities, those unique opportunities that community colleges can provide uh, to those who are looking for that two-year credential or maybe looking for stackable yeah. credentials or even to go into the four-year programs mm -hmm. and beyond. So I'd say it's very promising. And even if it's not happening at the federal level, um, there's just so much to pay attention to at the state level. And I would encourage those invested uh, kind of in this work to continue paying attention. I would agree. And I think as, uh, especially considering um I mean, granted, I think that there are, uh, even if it were to be free public ed education for all, I think that there are drawbacks to that and there's mm -hmm. politics to consider. But I think states are are leading the charge in a lot of ways to create really amazing policies and, and, and structural education programs for students. Um, now, let's talk about the Higher Education Act. Um, <laughs> Uh, and for those who aren't familiar, the, the Higher Education Act was, generally speaking, it's very broad, so I, I'm not going to give a piece-by-piece piece, uh, component to it, but generally speaking, it was enacted to provide and strengthen financial resources for students to pursue education beyond secondary school. Um, and much of the current structure of our financial aid and grant system is built from this act. Um, unfortunately, reauthorization has been an issue for this act, and I believe the last time it was reauthorized was 2008. Please correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. Yep. And I was wanting to be like, no, it was 2016, so it could be a little <laughs> bit more hopeful, but that's a long time ago. Um, it's nearly when the recession or the financial crisis happened. But anywho. Um, <laughs> Administrations. Yes. All of it. Uh, but I think given the priority yeah. of college affordability for students, this is undoubtedly a huge policy issue. And I'm curious to get your thoughts on the Higher Education Act, because I've heard in multiple settings where some folks say that reauthorization isn't going to may not be much of a help. You kind of have to break the whole thing apart and, and build it back again. Or there's more an opportunity to re revamp certain programs like FAFSA. Um, do you believe it will ever be restructured or at minimum reauthorized to provide a stronger financial support for students? Sure. So I think before I answer that piece of it, I'd, I'd just like to uh, name that I think federal policy often signals the policy priorities of the yeah. nation, right? So this was the intention all the way back in 1965 when um, you know, legislators really wanted to get at that yeah. core issue of college affordability when it was becoming uh, less and less attainable. So I think this legislation is widely considered a cornerstone of higher education law policy from throughout Absolutely. our nation's history, certainly. Um, and what we have seen since 2008, the last reauthorization, as you mentioned, is um, you know, several efforts to pull out pieces and restructure. Um, so we know that it's still top of mind. Um, and reauthorization is always a possibility. Like, I'm not here to say anything's <laughs> impossible, but um, as far as anytime soon, I'm not exactly sure um, if that's coming anytime soon. But I think the core issue here is 
um, our students' financial needs being met. And that could be through TRIO programs or just their daily uh, living expenses, whatever that is. And like I said earlier, there's lots of work going on at the state level um, to help address those needs. There's also been other efforts by Congress um, since 2008 to address those needs. So really um, making sure that that core question of our students' financial needs being met so that we can also move on to those other wraparound services that I discussed earlier. Um, I think that's the core question, but we also need to consider um, when it's not happening at the federal level, what does that signal for states, right? Because when states are looking to prioritize, and we've already talked about states kind of leading the charge in certain areas of affordability, especially for community colleges, but um, it can certainly signal that it's not a priority at the national level, which can make yeah. it challenging for states to really adopt it at the state level as well. So. We must consider those implications and then also what does that do for the consistency of when states do adopt uh, new policies, right? Because you might have a student on the West Coast um, getting very different treatment than a student yeah. on the East Coast um, when there's no kind of federal um, legislation to tie that all together. So just things to keep in mind there. Yeah. And I and I think kind of leading into the next part, I feel like right now, I feel like higher education is in a space where there's actually a plethora of opportunities for change at the policy level. Um, and it's kind of to that point, what are what do you believe are the most pertinent laws pol and policies legislators and college leaders should focus on advocating for in the coming months? Yeah, so at the Hunt Institute, we really do take a, a bipartisan approach um, to our work and our efforts. And we like to look at policy holistically. And um, like Javed alluded to earlier, like it really shouldn't get political in the education space, but there are there are a few policy priority areas that we really think um, are important for legislators on both sides of the aisle to consider, um, whether that be at the federal or the state level. Um, college affordability, as you mentioned, uh, you know, I think the current uh, forbearance, a lot of people are going to be affected by that potentially. And so again, looking at states potentially um, intervening there, um, if the federal policy is not working out is, you know, someplace that we need to turn our attention to. And then also moving into that issue of basic needs and security and really providing those um, student support wraparound services that help uh, address a, a student's holistic learning experience inside and outside of the classroom, um, regardless of the credential that they may be pursuing. So I think that's a secondary uh, area that is equally important, honestly. Yeah. So looking at that as well. And then, of course, pathways to higher education. So again, like um, CTE, workforce development, looking all, at all those issues and really turning our attention to just, you need a four-year credential. That's not necessarily true for everyone. Yeah. So, you know, looking at those stackable credentials, those short-term credentials, um, I really think all of these areas are a priority in the coming months and coming years, certainly. But I think something that doesn't get enough attention is how are we implementing these policies when they're handed down? Because we really have to consider supporting the, including faculty and staff, right? The people who are in charge of implementing the administrators. Um, are we supporting them so that students can ultimately yeah. uh, reap the benefits of equitable education policy making? I think that's a bigger question for us yeah. as well. Yeah, and I, and I feel like, again, because of the, um, even when there are instances where there's uh, the federal government steps in and provides that support to institutions, for instance, during COVID-19 with funding, um, even that differed depending on which institution that you went to, because there wasn't a clear consensus of how it was going to be. I mean, there were general guidelines, but for how it was going to be implemented and enacted across the board. Uh, so again, I think that students had a different mm -hmm. experience of that funding that they may or may not receive depending on which institution that they went to so i think that implement that implementation piece is a piece of it as well i i love what you said about the four-year degree it's in in its relevance is kind of i wouldn't say it's waning but it's in question for sure uh, i think as students yeah. discover there's more there's more there's multiple ways that they can get to to the career pathway that they desire and i think a lot of organizations and companies are creating credentials for students uh who are seeking a pathway so that they don't have to take out exorbitant amounts of loans or go through a financial aid process uh that can be tricky for for some students as well. So uh, love, love what's happening in that space. And I'm kind of excited to see how states and, and 
in the federal government react to to how that is happening um i it kind of feels like the, they're a little slow to the chase at this point m- mostly because covid-19 i think has spurred that up quite a bit but um i'm curious to see kind of what happens there absolutely my last question for you both is uh Kind of going off my last part is that I think uh, given some of the issues that we're seeing at the policy level for students, while they might not be um, well versed in all of the different laws and policies that impact them, I think they are definitely seeking ways um, at the micro level to to fight back against these changes and want to be involved in the process, um, whether it's through just simply voting for elected officials who are going to make their promise to, to more equitable forms of education or if they decide to pursue alternative pathways um, to their career that don't necessarily involve the traditional four-year degree. Um, To that point, how can students get involved uh, in public policy that impacts colleges and universities? And are there tangible ways or or grassroots efforts students, uh, or grassroots ways and efforts that students can use to get connected to these issues? We generally believe in in always encouraging students to get involved in in internships, uh, local, state, um, even national organizations uh, as early and as often as their uh, circumstances allow. Um, We also encourage these organizations to consider compensating interns to increase access to such opportunities because uh, as their circumstances allow, you know, we know there are some young people that are not able to partake in internships uh, or fellowships uh, because they can't financially afford to give up uh, a, a job that they have while they're in school. So uh, students uh, should seek out unique opportunities. Uh, one we, uh, we are really proud about is the John M. Belk uh, Impact Fellowship, um, which we are you know, sort of facilitating and we're a, a benefactor of it because we have uh, a couple of students here that are housed with us over the course of their 10 month uh, uh, journey. And so we're wrap- actually wrapping up in early May, the second cohort of fellows, but it was designed to build a pipeline of future leaders in the area of, of social impact. Uh, and it's a 10 month uh, process. So they're, they're all compensated. Um, we think they're strategically positioned in some of our partner organizations. Next year, we're looking to place a couple in the uh, legislature. Um, so we're, we're, we're doing our part and we're, we're seeing more and more organizations that actually are leaning into paying for interns and paying for fellowships. Uh, we pay our interns and have been doing that for several years. Uh, and this impact fellowship now is just on year two and they are also you know they're, they're uh, being compensated as well so i think that's just part of the problem is we need to continue to increase the awareness of students of the circumstances uh, circumstances surrounding many of our students um and you know all need to lean in and do our part again if you're if i'm not getting paid i can't <laughs> if i'm getting paid i'm making the grades um uh, and at this point i believe even the white house is now paying interns so if the white house not to say that these institutions are the white house they are not but all that to say um i think it's important to create those pathways especially in the policy space where it's like you need you need those change makers you need those champions of education who uh, uh and to provide opportunities for those folks to be supported while they're attempting to make that change uh at the policy level for sure Absolutely. And increasing, we always encourage increasing civic engagement as well, you know, contacting your local lawmakers. I hear from policymakers all the time that they really do want to hear from students. They want to hear the student voice. So the emails, the the calls, those really do make a difference. And uh, hopefully there are there will be um i'm also hopeful to to see colleges and universities lean into the the space of uh politically engaged students on campus um i feel like just based on the history of higher education some colleges and universities don't necessarily know how to react to a student activist because sometimes those policies go against or those actions go against them so but that should also be a, a level of accountability right but i also see the other side of the lever where um we could really mobilize student activists who are charged and are so aware of the of the needs that are the things that need to happen at the college level and use them to advocate um, at the state and federal level um, in addition to the levers and the resources that colleges and universities employ themselves Um, there's a lot of room for collaboration that just hasn't 
uh, I don't think has been fully tapped into, but I think now that we're kind of in this new political space in society, I'm, I'm hopeful to see that happen. With that in mind, uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Siddiqui, uh, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been a really great conversation, and I look forward to connecting with you both soon and seeing the great work that Hunt Institute is going to do, not only just uh, for policymakers, but also for students as well. I would like to thank Dr. Siddiqui and Dr. Smith for joining me for today's discussion. Follow or subscribe to our channel wherever you're watching or listening, and stay tuned for the next installment of Higher Ed Next. If you want to see more content related to today's episode, visit Best Colleges for our latest news and commentary. Until next time.